We've all seen crested geckos and leopard geckos, right? Really popular, great pets, and for a good reason too. Well, maybe you decided that you want to start keeping some geckos, but not necessarily those. You want something a little bit different. You kind of know what you're doing, or you want to get into something a little bit different, but you've never kept them before. Well, I have five animals that I think would be a good intro into keeping geckos that aren't just kind of your bread and butter animals. And this is five inexpensive geckos that also make good pets for beginners, intermediates, or experts. And that goes for keeping these animals as well as people who have never kept a pet or even people who have kept reptiles, you know, but not necessarily geckos. Like I do a lot of snakes. If you're like me and you like snakes, but you're interested in these other ones and you want something a little bit different, well, here we go. We'll get started on this. So the first one I think is really cool and that I actually probably see the most often is the flying gecko. So the flying gecko was a really cool small little gecko from Southeast Asia that gets its name for pretty obvious reason. They don't actually fly. There's, as far as I'm aware, there's no such thing as an actual flying lizard or a flying snake. They're more like gliding, parachuting type animals, right? Well, what they do is they have very flappy, loose skin that will expand out when they jump from limb to limb, from tree to tree, whatever may have you, that will spread out, slow their descent down, and make it look like they're flying or gliding over to different places. They show up on importer's tables quite often, like, you know, the big three-letter name that we all know and love, uh, the different reptile shows. They are on those type of tables quite often, you know, very inexpensive. So the problem with those is they're imports, and so unfortunately you have to kind of watch them a little bit. But these guys are really cool. They don't need to be kept in very large spaces, but if you can, they will certainly utilize them. You just may not necessarily see them doing that. They are nocturnal. They do like a little bit of a small basking spot. Nothing crazy like the high 80s. Uh, so a little bit more than you would have like a crested gecko or something like that. But a little basking spot, like a little daylight bulb, is all you'd really need for them. Give them lots of cover. Um, give them something that looks a little bit more naturalistic because they do camouflage really well. Their tails, while probably aid in gliding those really big fanned out tails and hands, while they do help probably with the descent and gliding around, they also make really great adaptations for camouflage. And so if you give them like a really cool cork bark background, lots of sticks, lots of naturalistic looking or even just straight bioactive things to interact with and hide and hide in and amongst, you're going to have a much happier, healthier, more comfortable gecko to where when you do get to actually see them, they look really well. They are insectivores, so no Pangea mix for these guys, but they eat, they can eat a wide variety of like small to pinhead crickets, small mealworms, little dubias that you might get them confident enough to eat off your hands. They're not very handleable, but they do look really cool and they're fun to keep. I always thought it'd be really fun to get like one of those tall, like wide exoterras and just keep a small group of them and like heavily plant two sides of them and see if they would sit there and like glide back and forth. Haven't been able to do that yet, but I always thought that'd be really, really cool. So this next one is one that I actually just recently acquired and I'm really excited to play with a little bit. Um, and that is the crocodile gecko or the Moorish gecko. So, and when I say play with, they're actually not super handleable. These guys are really cool. At least I certainly think so. They kind of get their name from their almost like crocodile looking uh, exterior. They have a lot of kind of bumpy, rough texture to their back scalations and even their tails are almost a little bit spiky at the base which what they get their name the crocodile gecko these guys are found all throughout the mediterranean from like north africa up into southern france and greece and that whole little area so when i was doing research on these guys both before i got it as well as doing this there was a little bit of conflicting information because a lot of the places where they are it's fairly rocky and kind of dry but being in the Mediterranean, the humidity is also just a lot higher too. So you end up this kind of weird like, well, how do we do that? And so basically in captivity, we've figured out that to do fairly well is they are arboreal. They don't have the sticky pads, or by sticky pads, I mean they don't have the pads with the tiny little fibers that make electrostatic shocks, which is why they're able to cling to little objects, but we're not getting it again in this video. They do have regular little fingers with little claws. They are avid climbers, but they can't climb up glass. So if you give them a nice tall setup, like, you know, 
an 18 by 18 or 29 or something like that for a full grown adult with lots of rocks and barks and like cork bark and sticks that are offset at an angle, they will absolutely utilize that. And then you can kind of section off one hot spot because they do need a little bit of UVB. They are, they're kind of crepuscular. They're, they say they're more active at night, but they're absolutely found out basking and moving around in the early parts of the day and in the evening as well. So give them a little bit of UVB on like one side, give them a little bit of a warm spot of like 90 as a basking spot. And the other part, make sure that it's a little bit cooler and has plenty of humid hides. I would recommend maybe doing a lot of a fairly, you know, fairly thick substrate of a humidity holding substrate of like eco earth topsoil, that type of thing. Maybe throwing a little bit of play sand as to kind of keep it a little sandy and aerated a little bit, but they do really well is kind of a little bit of back and forth. They're fairly easy gecko to, to maintain once you get their setup of having both a small basking spot as well as high humidity. They get not quite as big as a Tokay gecko, probably about seven, eight inches long, and they can be handled a little bit, but they're not going to like bulldog you like a Tokay will, where they'll just sit there and go ah, ah, at you and then latch on once they get a hold of you. But they are still a really cool gecko. After that, let's move on to some more terrestrial runs. So we have a panther gecko. These guys are really cool. They've actually been in the hobby for a while under a different name, and that is the Pictus Gecko. And I remember reading about these when I very first started to get into reptiles just in general, and they kind of just faded away. And I'm going to guess the reason is because of the popularity of the Leopard Gecko. But these guys are really cool and arguably are just as good, if not a better beginner reptile lizard specifically than a leopard gecko their only downfall is they're not super well handleable um and that's because they have a tendency to be a little bit of skittish and a little bit flighty um, another name for these guys are actually called the big headed gecko which is really the only way that you can kind of easily tell the difference between males and females yes you can take a look at their you know femoral pores and things like that but the males have a much larger head than the females and even then they still have really big heads hence big headed geckos these guys are actually really really cool they're found in madagascar um as are a lot of the animals that we have in the reptile hobby honestly um they are ground dwelling terrestrial you won't ever really see them up in the trees at all they like to hide under rocks under you know falling over trees under the leaf litter during the day and then when at night and they're found kind of in like the central northern part of us of madagascar and, and then at night they'll come out and hunt for all sorts of different little bugs and little creepy crawlies like that these guys have a wide variety of just naturally occurring patterns. They can be different colors. They can be striped. They can not be striped, almost kind of like a blotchy color. They're really, really cool geckos, um, and they don't get very large either. They're a lot smaller. They probably only get about six inches-ish, might be the biggest they get. So they can do fairly well in a smaller tank, like a 10, 20-gallon aquarium, and you know give them a little bit of a little basking spot nothing too crazy um very similar setup to i would say like an african fat tail gecko where they still need heat they still need it to be a nice little basking spot a little bit dry but they definitely need that humid hide so if you kind of treat them like an african fat tail gecko you'll probably won't go wrong with that um the other thing with these guys is that supposedly they are incredibly prolific breeders um once they hit sexual maturity and the breeding season start, supposedly they will lay quite a few eggs every two weeks for the entire breeding season. So supposedly they do very well, as well as their eggs are like tiny little ping pongs. They're spherical and they're hard. Most like, but most reptile eggs, you know, they're, they're kind of soft and kind of squish a little bit. They're more leathery. They don't have that hard shell to maintain the water. Um, Cause you know, when they're hard, they maintain water. They don't lose that. They don't lose hydration. But these guys, they're hard. So they're just kind of a really cool little gecko that I think are really fun. Um, this next one is one that I've never messed with, but I know they're really cool. And that is the yellow-headed dwarf gecko. So these geckos actually come from the New World down in South America. Um, they don't have pads, so they don't like to climb on everything, but they are avid climbers. Um, usually found amongst rocks um in and amongst like fallen over limbs and things like that um they do like it a little warm so if you're and they're you know they're dwarf geckos they don't get very large so something like a 10 or a 20 gallon tank again these are all the smaller geckos you know very first getting into it that so that's why these work very well as kind of you know 
dipping your toes into the water a little bit. They don't get very large, but hence the dwarf part. But they do like a little bit warmer, so like 75 to 85. So a little bit warmer than room temp, but we're not talking like bearded dragon temps, right? So maybe like a little heat pad or something on the bottom. If you're going to give them UVB, make sure that, you know, you give them plenty of shade because they will be active, you know, still the corpuscular reptile. But, you know, make sure you give them, you know, a lot of shade and a lot of cover to get not have direct UVB, even if it's a lighter amount of UVB versus like, you know, the 5.0 and the 10.0. They are really cool. They will eat all sorts of like little pinhead crickets. They're really fun. Um, that also being said, they are sexually dimorphic, similar to the Pictus or the Panther geckos, but a little bit more traditionally how we think, like a mallard duck, where the males are really brightly colored. That's that yellow head, that blue black body, bright yellow orange head. Female, they're kind of drab. They're more of like a whitish gray, but they're still really cool, and you can easily have a small breeding group of them. And I think that'd be really cool to just every once in a while you just see like a tiny little yellow head just like dart out really quick, grab a little pin and cricket or a little millworm, and then dash back under their cover. And that's really cool. And I like to see those kind of more natural behaviors of these animals versus not as great. And so when you have a smaller animal, it gives you more of an opportunity to go a little to give them a little bit more space and get a little more creative with their enclosures to maybe try to get some of those more natural behaviors which is really fun to see before you kind of start to go really big um and then the last one i think is dangerous and criminally underrated and that is the banded gecko banded geckos are really cool and have been around in the hobby for a very very long time probably longer than the pictus gecko these guys are native to the united states they're found in like the southwest united states down into mexico and even central america and they're basically look like mini new world leopard geckos they keep their banding like the babies they don't get kind of modeled with the little bumps and stuff as a lot of the different leopard gecko subspecies get but they stay pretty small you know like four or five ish inches is about the biggest you'll get the only downside of these guys is they're not super handleable they will squeak croak and scream at you and they'll let you know that they don't like being handled but they are really cool and honestly i've always liked the kind of more deserty arid enclosure setups where you can sit there and use like the pea gravel and the really cool deserty looking ones and you can kind of make little rock shells and stuff and i think those look really really cool and a banded gecko is one that you can absolutely do that these guys are found fairly readily down in that part of the area you'll see them at night like in people's houses if you're kind of out in the boonies a little bit crossing roads just hunting for all sorts of little uh, insects and stuff they're really cool there's a wide variety of different colors and patterns because there's a fair number of subspecies um they can't really be collected anymore in the field in a lot of the places where they're found but they've been in the hobby for a while and so there are some select people out there that held on to them and are still breeding them and you're allowed to have them they just can't be field collected anymore um, a lot of them do come out of nevada uh, which is where they are naturally occurred, where they are allowed to be field collected, but they do breed fairly easily in captivity, similar to leopard geckos. Maybe just a little bit more effort needs to be put in. But if you're really interested in... Oh, wait, I, I totally forgot something. These guys have a really other cool adaptation that I want to talk about. I don't know how I forgot about this. These guys eat scorpions. So if you live in places like this, the little baby scorpions or the smaller ones, they eat them which is great. That's like, hey, more reason to keep them around, right? And in addition to that, in addition to the, you know, the screaming and the barking and the croaking, they will straight up imitate a scorpion where they will sit there and they'll like spread out and hunch down and they'll throw their tail up over their back like a scorpion's tail. And they'll just assume this defensive position and then like still scream and croak and squeak at you a little bit. And they look really cool. I just wanted to say that. I just like all the little fun adaptations that these guys have. So I don't know how I almost forgot about that. But if you like this list or, you know, want to know about anything else, please let me know. Email me at Jay-Z's, Jay-Z-S, because somebody has Jay-Z reptiles and they won't give me it back. Um, Jay-Z's reptiles at gmail.com. Um, I'll answer any questions to the best of my ability that I can. Any comments, if you want to know anything more, have anything really cool to contribute, just keep it civil is all I ask. Put it down in the comments. I'll do my best to get back at you. Um, hope you enjoyed the video. If there's anything else you want to see, please let me know. Hope you're having a great day and we'll check you next time.